Hoy abre las jornadas Lisa Holman. Eh, Lisa es directora del proyecto de Tecnologías de Información y de Comunicación de la Red Neerlandesa de Recursos de Guerra. Trabaja en la digitalización, vinculación e intercambio de los recursos neerlandeses sobre la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Hasta junio de 2016 fue gestora de datos en el RIC Museum de Ámsterdam y responsable de la difusión de los sistemas de gestión de la colección y el intercambio de datos abiertos. Eh, y se estudió Historia de la Cultura en la Universidad Nimengen de los Países Bajos y se especializó en digitalización, automatización de metadatos estructurados y presentación en línea del patrimonio cultural. Hoy su ponencia versará sobre la importancia de enlazar datos, remisión, colecciones compartidas y semánticamente enriquecidas. Gracias. Um. Egon on everyone. Good morning. Uh, I hope I pronounced this right. Um, my drive taxi driver yesterday taught me these words. Um, good morning. Um, at this very early hour, and I hope you can all hear me in the back of the room. Um, I would like to take you on a little journey I took over the last decade. Um, I used to work at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and currently I work for the network of war resources. And at my work, um, I took a journey from a not very open organization to a linked open network of organizations. Um, so this is where I started in 2010 at the Rijksmuseum. The museum was closed, as this museum will close, uh, but unfortunately the Rijksmuseum wanted to close for three years and stayed closed for ten years. So by the ninth year, uh, everyone sort of forgot about the museum. We were a grey area in the Netherlands. Um, and actually, our collection was already published online by everyone except for the Rijksmuseum. This is just a random screenshot of one of the highlights of the Rijksmuseum collection. Uh, but this also triggered us in discussing the question, why don't we publish our images online? Why do we keep them to ourselves? Um, it's one thing to keep your pictures to yourself, but the audience starts getting silly ideas about your collections. So this, for instance, is a very poor reproduction of a 17th century uh, painting. The original painting is very colorful, but as you can see, this is a 1970s reproduction. And people actually think that this is the original because it looks old. And the only thing that looks old is probably the ectochrome that was digitized. Um, and this is also what happened during the decade that the Rijksmuseum was closed. Uh, our audience changed. No longer do people first read the signs next to your paintings. Uh, they watch their iPhones to find information. Or like this group of children, it looks as if they're completely ignoring art. Um, so, as a museum, you can ignore this new digital world and do your own thing and stay within the walls of your own museum. Um, but the big question for us was, will we last the 21st century and continue to exist in the 22nd century if we continue on this, this road? And we decided that we wanted to join the digital world and see what it could bring for the museum. And this is, and I don't know if you've all seen the website, um, in 2013 we built the Rijks Studio. Does anyone know the Rijks Studio in the audience? Um, well, let me explain a bit about it, you know it. Um, it's uh, the website of the Rijks Museum. We published all of our collections online in high resolution. Uh, currently, there's almost 600,000 images of art online in high resolution, free for downloading. Um, so some of the images are like 5 or 6 MB. It's at least 1,000 pixels or four or 5,000 pixels. 
Um, so it's a lot of images and people like on Pinterest can use the collection to create sets of their own. So you can download the images for free, reuse it in any way you like, uh, and you can create your own Pinterest sets on our website to collect the things you like in our museum. And this Pinterest part of the website, called the Reich Studio, is actually the most popular part of the website. Um, we discovered that most people are small curators. They love to collect things, and it can range from I love the color blue to toys depicted in 17th century works of art. There's one lady collecting uh, brushes to clean fire plates, and she found 500 in the collection of the Rijksmuseum. And as you can see, since 2013, uh, 600,000 sets were created by all kinds of people. Most of them don't work in the museum. Most of them don't even visit the museum because they live in China or New Zealand or the US. Uh, but they, they played with the Rijksmuseum collection and they are aware of the museum and of the art in the museum. So they're learning something without visiting the museum. And um, the website had a huge impact. Our old website uh, got maybe 10,000 visitors a month, and we were really proud of that kind of numbers. This website draws some, somewhere between 300 and 500,000 visitors a month. So again, showing the collection, making it available for people to play with it, has a huge impact on the museum and the awareness of people um, about the collections of the museums. And this is, again, everyone is a curator. Uh, one of the things that struck me was that people find things in the collection that we couldn't find. Uh, the collection of the Rijksmuseum consists of a million objects, so you tend to forget specific parts. And this is a person that found something about Japan in, in our collection. And you know, it's great attention for this very tiny part of our collection. Um, we. At the Rijksmuseum, we declared our collections open. It was a, in 2012, that was a very radical statement. Uh, we had a long debate internally because we, we literally said, we're not going to sell images anymore. We're going to give up this business model. Uh, we're an ICOM organization. We promised to share our collections with everyone. So let's start share it and see if we can make money from other activities but not from selling individual images. Um, and when we said open, we also figured we wanted to open the collection for technicians, other app builders, other web builders, scientists, and so on. And this is when I currently call it the API mania started. An API is an application programming interface, and if you say that you're open, you're of course also you know, you build an API. Um, we didn't know for whom we would build an API. We knew nothing about APIs, but we just did it. And it was fun, um, but it's a lot of technical stuff and no one understands what you're doing and not even the whiz, whiz kids, you know, that work with computers know how to deal with your collection information. Especially since we didn't just share a couple of objects, we shared 200,000 objects. So. We actually caused some panic with programmers um, about this. So in the end, it was a big success, but it was for completely different reasons. No one understood the API, and it was you know, just sitting there until the people of Wikipedia, or Wikimedia, uh, I, this is Wikimedia Commons, they picked up on the API. And they got in touch with us and asked us if they could harvest our paintings collection. And we said, yeah, sure, we share with everyone. Um, so they harvested our images and put it on Wikimedia Commons. And as you can see, it's not, for me, it's not a very attractive picture. It's just a lot of images. So we, again, ignored it for quite some time. And then someone from the Wiki commu community, uh, he contacted me and said, did you look at your statistics on Wikimedia Commons? I couldn't even find it at first. 
Um, but here it is, and I don't know if you can, no, it's awful, you can't read it. Um, as I said, the Rijksmuseum website uh, drew 300,000 visitors a month. This is our Wikimedia statistics for uh, July. And as you can see, um, 14 and a half million page views one month, just July. Um, and that is a completely different ball game. That is something that an individual institute can never accomplish on its own. You need large communities like Wikimedia to achieve this. Um, and what is also very interesting is to see, uh, unfortunately, uh, the colors are very bad in the wiki statistics, but I will put these slides on SlideShare. Um, you can also see that there's a big difference, for instance, between the English Wikipedia and the Spanish Wikipedia. Uh, people from the Spanish languages are more interested in William of Orange, whereas the English uh, visitors <coughs> are more interested in Amsterdam. So there's also a differentiation between people from different languages, which again makes it very interesting for a museum to see how you can respond to digital audiences from different parts of the world um, and treat your digital museum as a real museum. Um, so this was mind-blowing for us. And well, how do I get from open to link to open? Um, at the Rijksmuseum, it started with crowd involvement. Uh, we were doing our own cute things, uh, annotating, and then, of course, Wikipedia came in, and the audience started to respond to our collections. Uh, in the beginning, they just send us emails like these here. And it's, it's not just rubbish emails, it's real important information. Um, a lot of times, it's about uh, interesting historical facts and very specialist knowledge from the audience. Um, so we figured we were onto something. We wanted the audience, all the experts out there to be involved with our collections. Uh, and the first thing we did was we added a little tagger to the website. And this is what happened. Um, as you can see, someone had a great evening, probably with a lot of beer, and started to insult people. So someone is called gay and started to spam us. So there's like vermeerapartments.com and I don't know what is. Uh, but this was definitely not the way to go. We had to take down the tagger system um, because it was very confusing and it was abused a lot of times and it didn't add anything to the knowledge we already had. And now I'm gonna uh, tease you with a horrible slide. Um, but the, the, so the, the very basic, simple crowdsource thing wasn't working for us, but we knew that there were people in the audience that had very good knowledge about parts of our collection and usually knowledge about stuff that we knew nothing about. And this is when we started uh, experimenting with the, what we call the semantic crowdsource model. So we figured that for most things, uh, most uh, knowledge areas out there, uh, there are ontologies or knowledge structures, <clears throat> and a lot of them are available as thesauri or as linked open resources. Uh, so for instance, uh, we use the AAT, the Arts and Architecture Thesaurus, to annotate objects, uh, types, object names, materials, techniques. Uh, if you connect your registration and if you connect your website, to this ontology, if someone is entering a keyword, then this ontology will help you annotate your collection. It will auto-complete what you're entering, and it will also check to see if the entry is either something that exists and is documented or is garbage. Um, and we started our experiment with BERT. We know nothing about birds in the museum, but there are so many different items with birds depicted on it, and the bird watching community is very active in the Netherlands. So we selected uh, a couple of thousand uh, images from the Rijksmuseum collection that was, were only described as, you know, uh, print with bird, painting with birds, 
uh, swans in a lake, so you wouldn't even be able to find it because one half of the collection was, was uh, birds and the other half was uh, swans. So we collected it and we started building um, a, a tool that we call a niche sourcing tool. So it's not for the crowd, it's for a niche, a very specific target group that has specialist information, and in this case about birds. And there's a huge ontology out there about birds. It's the ontology of life, I think it's called. So it has all the Linnaean names of birds and plants and whatever, but every little bit of nature is described very well. And we connected the bird um, section of this ontology to our website. And this is first, of course, uh, where the geeks got in. Uh, we had a lot of programmers helping us create a tool. So this is the first thing they built. You know, we're going to be linked to open, and it's going to be linked to open data. So here's my triples. Want to see my triples? And we were, <laughs> you know, how are we going to work with bird people if this is what we're going to do? Total panic. And then we said, can you please build an interface? And then they did something like this, which again, freaked us out. We're museum people. We like beautiful things and this looks awful. You know, I'm not going to work with something that looks awful. <laughs> and also, um, the biggest mistake here we made, this was a, a, set, a set about castles. Um, so we had our nice little boxes on the side where people could enter information. Uh, but if you want to dis depict, a, if you want to describe a very t small part of an image, how do you do that? How can you say, well, there's this and so and so bird, at, you know, at the branch of this and this tree? You need something more visual to deal with that. Um, so this was, for me, the most exciting part of the project, is getting programmers, they were very happy with this interface and they thought I was a nagging, over designy person. Uh, but to get them from this to this was such a big step for us. And this is actually, this is our current uh, version of the Accurator, so the niche sourcing tool. And the interface just is the work of art. You can put your mouse on a bird, you can draw a simple box around the bird, and then an, a, a, a fill-in uh, field appears, and you can enter the name of the bird, and the, uh, the um, ontology helps you out to complete uh, your entry. So it's a fully automized, but also very visual way of annotating objects. And um, unfortunately, it, it took us like one and a half years to get here. Uh, so that was quite a long, um, long way to go. Uh, and then we decided to test it on bird watchers. And this is actually one of the best events I ever organized. Um, I had no expectations because I, I know nothing about birds. I still know nothing about birds. Um, so I asked a couple of people that knew something about birds to tell it to their friends, and then rumors started spreading. And we ended up with a radio crew. There's a bird watcher radio show in the Netherlands at eight o'clock Sunday morning, so they came. And there was even the nine o'clock news, the Dutch nine o'clock news was there because everyone thought it sounded funny to go bird watching at the Rijksmuseum. There was even a guy with a safari suit and his binoculars with him to go bird watching in the museum. Um, so we had 50 people and that was the maximum uh, for this room. We couldn't deal with more people. And I have to look into my um, exact notes, but I think they did something like four and a half thousand birds over three or four hours. They were really grouping together, sitting together, helping each other, and doing, you know, massive typing there. So it took us months to deal with all the, <laughs> the information they generated. But for me, it was a big sign that um, this kind of crowdsourcing, this niche sourcing, uh, is very useful. You get so much new information uh, that you actually have to think about ways of dealing with these kinds of this amount of information. Um, 
but also um, the fact that people would sit together and do it together really impressed me because my image of crowdsourcing was that someone was doing it at home on his own at his computer, whereas this was a very social event. Uh, I don't know what to do with it, uh, but I'm still thinking about to organizing more social events where you can have specific crowds to annotate specific parts of your collections. Um, so after this project, I moved to, the, uh, to a new organization, the Network of War Resources. So it's a completely different subject. Uh, we currently collect all uh, heritage, all digital heritage about the Second World War in the Netherlands. Our current database consists of 10 million objects, but it will probably grow to 100 million different objects ranging from archival documents to images, uh, but also to names um, of people uh, killed in the uh, concentration camps, but also soldiers died at war, people convicted after war for collaboration, etc. Um, and currently, um, we're working with a lot of groups on what I would call commemoration sourcing. Again, it's a sp specialist kind of crowdsourcing. Um, but it's all about individuals and remembering individuals, remembering victims of the war. Um, and then um, some of these projects already ran for quite some time. Uh, again, we're looking at linked open data as a way to connect all these people. Because, for instance, there are archives at Yad Vashem about people killed in the concentration camps. There are uh, Red Cross archives. There are uh, digital monuments for the different groups that died in the war. Uh, but how do you know that a person with a specific name is exactly the same person as a person with a name that looks similar in another resource. Uh, so again, we're looking at ways to crowdsource with linked open data resources to connect all information so we don't end up with, you know, standalone things. Um, and this is uh, a demonstrator. I think uh, Mr. Hivone will go into these kinds of things more than I am. Uh, this is, was a demonstrator built in 2015 uh, to show what linked open data can do for these communities. So the, the, the middle blob is a person, and you can see through linked open data, uh, this is, I think, Primo Levi, where he was deported, whom his relatives were, um, where he lived, and so on and so on. So each blob is a different kind of information, but you can, you can click on them so you can see who his parents were. And when you click on his parents, you can see where they went and who they were related with. And it's really, really beautiful new way of demonstrating this kind of information. And unfortunately, this is just a demonstrator. But you can also, on the left, connect images and archival documents to it. So for me, this is a beautiful example of how we can uh, visualize the Second World War and its massive but very inaccessible documentation that we currently hold. Uh, and I'm going to end now, but this is just uh, a way of demonstrating the problem we're dealing with. I'm very sorry that this is all in Dutch, uh, but this is just one out of a million photo or a million archival objects that we have. And all the green arrows point at people and places and events in this specific photograph. But as you can see, it's unstructured. It's just written down by someone. And what we're currently working on is creating new tools uh, where we can extract data from text uh, and link it to resources. Um, and then this is a very visual tool that we're currently testing because I still fight every geek that tries to pull programming on my, <laughs> on my neck. Um, and this is how we try to combine uh, text to uh, places and names and digital resources that are out there. Uh, and that would be my, I hope, my uh, result in the next couple of years is that through one story you can find many other stories and then just go through the war. Um, well, thank you so much, and I hope if you have any questions, you will ask them. <laughs> <laughs>